Good morning. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, 1.21 gigawatts. This is a talk and talk on hacking solar panel controllers. I am Professor Plum. I am a security research researcher for Stage Two. Um, usually we do pen tests and IoT audits. This one, though, this one wasn't a customer request. This is just kind of something I did on my own on the side. A little background: of What got me started on this path? Uh, everyone in 2020, right, found themselves maybe at home a little more, maybe with a little extra free time. And about that same time, or a little earlier, my neighbor got this new solar panel system control uh, installed on his house. And as he was telling me about it, there were some features or things it did that kind of piqued my interest. And so I thought uh, this would be a good project to do while I'm stuck at home. So that's kind of what started me down this path. Um, I'm going to talk as I go through this presentation and kind of say what kind of things the vendor did to better improve their security over typical IoT stuff we'll see versus what kind of things they did to weaken their security. Just kind of a, a plus minus win loss scenario. And with that, I'll just kind of jump right into it. So whenever we do IoT work, wherever I research something, it's always open source research first, right? We want to see how far we can get with the data that's available online before you even purchase or acquire or touch the hardware. And so in this case, I did a little research on the product and how it's set up. Um, the particular solution that they had was the Enphase solution, where you can see here from their, their own slides, Enphase's slides, they've got a number of solar panel controllers up there at the top. They're all connected to this Enphase IQ controller system, which is over on, on the left. And that controller system is what uh, sends the output information, the consumption, the power production, up to in phase cloud container and at the cloud then your ipad device or your browser can kind of see what kind of data your solar system is producing uh, or not what kind of data what kind of production numbers you're getting etc what i also found interesting is that it's installed via a mobile app and so the mobile app wirelessly talks to the in phase controller in some sort of way so that was something i wanted to look at and then the cloud component also uh, piqued my interest. So I wanted to kind of play with those to see what, see what was there. Um, so like I said, first I, I grabbed the mobile apps. These, uh, there's two mobile apps. There's the installer toolkit, which is what the installer uses when they're setting up your system. And then there's the Enlightened Manager app, which is used by the end user to view power production and see how well they're doing based on weather, or, you know, et cetera, how much power they generated over the last 24 hours, days, weeks, whatever. The installer toolkit, though, was kind of interesting to me is that uh, you pressed a button on the end phase, or as the manual says so, you press a button on the end phase, and then the installer would just automatically connect to it. And so there was no real kind of authentication there, which really was surprising to me. And so I started looking into the app, and what the app is, it's actually a .NET application. So for Android, it's like Java that's wrapping .NET, but then that .NET application will call into a native assembly uh, DLL for these password functions. And that always gets me excited when I see something like that. Um, typically, when I see in an app, uh, it called into a native function, it's almost like it's trying to hide something, and so it puts it in this native application. I think many developers understand that .NET or Java code is very easy to decompile, and so they think, well, I'm gonna write this in assembly or, or C code, and because that gets compiled down to machine code, and that's harder to disassemble. But it's almost like, for, for me as a reverser, when I see something compiled on the machine code, it's like, oh, look here for the secrets because they obviously are trying to hide something and so they wrote a machine code. So that's the first place I look when I see something calling into an assembly DLL, I'll look into that. And sure enough, right, right here, there's a few exports that, you, that are Java, uh, C, C code that's ported for Java. But you see get mobile password, get password for serial number, get public password. And all these functions kind of boil down to the same thing, which is basically it'll take in a string. It'll do an MD5 of that string plus this uh, token string. You see in phase energy there on the screenshot. And then it computes an MD5 of that. That hex uh, digest is then ran through... Uh, I wouldn't say it's a CRC algorithm. It basically is just replacing ones and zeros and other uh, characters that are that are confusing sometimes with more distinct characters. So it's basically just taking part of that MD5, uh, modifies it slightly, and but that's the password. That's the installer password. Um, I'll talk more about this in the future, but this is um, this is kind of a big problem with these guys where they kind of do their own password system, and we'll talk about this a little bit. 
the, the, the input to this is the serial number for the device. So if you have the serial number, then you can get the installer password for that device. Another thing I found when I was looking at the app is that all the firmware packages are uh, on an S3 bucket. And so I used my command, S3 command line tools to just kind of poke out the bucket and we can see that the bucket's wide open. Yeah, I can do an LS on the bucket and list all the firmware packages there. Along with those firmware packages, there's XML files which explain which firmware products uh, apply to which devices. And there's even some installer scripts in there as well to kind of give me an idea of what the system's doing. So that was awesome. I thought I had everything I needed. However, if you'll notice there, a lot of those files have the EEPKG extension. This is an extension I haven't seen before, and when I tried to look through the files, it turned out that, that all these files were encrypted. So although the data was up there, it was all encrypted. Um, one of the install scripts did reference a decryption tool called EECrypt. You can see this on line 771 there. Um, but this EECrypt tool wasn't to be found. I'm assuming it's a file on the firmware. So here I am now stuck with a Catch-22. I have the firmware images, but they're encrypted. And to, to be able to decrypt the firmware images, I need a file off the firmware images. Um, this one thing kind of sent me back a little bit, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But um, suffice it to say, I have firmware images, but I need to find a way to decrypt them before I can really start to do heavy analysis. So with that, I have an installer password. I have some way to go forward, but I needed the device. Um, that's about as far as I could go with the open source security. So I acquired one of these devices off of eBay and started poking at it. Um, here's a screenshot of the device. And let's see if I, you can look at this with me real quick. So there's this line that divides the board in half. The bottom left side is the high power side. That's where your 10, 110 or 220 voltage is running through it. And then there's these chips here, which will convert that into, it'll track how many um, amps are running through there and, can, and calculate uh, power consumption and power production. That is passed to this custom in-phase chip here. And then that communicates with the main uh, system on a chip here. This is an ARM processor, uh, complete system on a chip. It has an external um, RAM here and this EEMC um, data storage here, which is the EXT4 file system. There's also a Wi-Fi chip, an Ethernet port, USB ports on this device. So there's a lot of there are a lot of functions and features available for attack on this. And then if you'll notice here, there's these headers that broken out. This is the UART header, and here is the JTAG headers. So many many attack opportunities available. And then also on the back side of this device, there's also a flash SPI chip not shown here. So what I'm going to do in this talk, I want to talk about some of the standard attacks we would make on a, a typical Linux embedded system. Um, there's kind of the boot process it goes through, and I'm going to list the attacks that we can do at each of those stages. But uh, I'm going to list them from reverse order. So I'm going to start at a fully boot system and work backwards. So it seems like I'm going backwards, but that seems to make the most sense to me because we're going to start with what most people are familiar with and then work slowly backwards from there. So starting at the bottom, right, that's when the system's fully boot up. You've got basically just a Linux kernel running. So your typical attacks against a Linux OS work here as well, where you're looking for what ports are open, what services it's running, what attacks do I have against those? Like, is there a telnet running, right? Is there an old version of SSH? Is there any um, HTTP vulnerabilities on anything that's hosting there? Those typical things are always available to attack at this run level. It's basically just a running Linux system. Um, Hardware-wise, there's also your, your these attacks the, against the UART and the JTAG. They're not specific to this boot process, right? They, JTAG can really be attempted at any time the chip is running. However, I'm going to list it here just because, right? It's the first it's the first stop. So, JTAG on this particular device was disabled. I'm not sure if it was via a fuse or if it was cut lines, but uh, I was not able to get JTAG or SWD working on this ARM chip. So that was a good plus for them. The UART did output, but it would not accept any input from the command line. Um, some, it's always worth a shot, right, to connect to that, and maybe if you press enter once or twice, you'll be presented with a command line. Uh, that I haven't, I've seen that before, but in this case, uh, the kernel was not accepting any input from the UART. It would um, output to the UART, so while the kernel would booting, was booting, it would show some messages there. Oh, wrong way. Okay, so the next attack level is while it's booting. I mentioned that you are showing me debug messages or kernel boot messages, which is somewhat helpful, but nothing in there was uh, easily broke the thing down. 
Um, what things you can do though is you can try to interrupt the boot, right? You can hit certain keys to try to stop the Linux kernel from booting. Um, maybe if you can change the boot arguments, you can have it boot into single kernel mode or single user mode or the change the init level so that it doesn't run all its scripts. But then again, that re requires the system accepting UART input. In this case, it did not, so I couldn't really affect the boot process there. Another thing I could try, which I did try, was glitching. Um, so glitching is where you can cause an uh, data errors in between communications. So, for example, this used an external eMMC chip for its ext4 boot partition, or so it's full partition actually. And so, if you can affect the boot lines in between the two, then when the kernel tries to mount that ext4 partition, you can you know, tie one of those lines to ground so the communication fails. And then you're hoping that the kernel is going to say, oh, I couldn't mount this partition and drop you to some kind of limited shell, at which point you have a shell and you can stop glitching the line, mount the system yourself and muck around with it. Uh, that wasn't the case here. The kernel did a panic when it can't mount the ext4 file system. And that's kind of the right approach when you're developing embedded systems, right? You know exactly what hardware you're expecting. And so if anything varies from that, you should just panic. You don't want to kind of fail open. And that's what this guy, these guys did. So that was a good design decision by them. It meant I had to look lower down in the boot process for another attack method. And that's um, the next stage before that would be the second level bootloader. This is very often U-Boot. Not always the case, but in most products we see U-Boot is the tool used. And what U-Boot is, it's a very lightweight boot level that knows how to read external ext4 file systems. So what it can do is it can read the ext4 file system, find the kernel image, copy it into memory, and then jump and pass execution to that kernel. That's basically what you, the U-Boot a stager is whole purpose is to do is to find the ext4 file system read the kernel image off of it and then boot to it pass the execution there um, the uboot itself has some parameters that it affects that it passes to the kernel and it also by default has like this three second delay where you can get to this very limited uboot console and change some of these parameters these guys had disabled that three boot boot delay second delay so i couldn't um just press a key and get to that uboot stager i wasn't able to get there. Um, the the U-boot itself, though, if you have ways of mucking with it, you can actually boot off of a TFTP image, right? Like you can tell it, hey, there's an image out here, kernel image, use that image rather than the image you're told to find. So, one, if you have access to the U-boot console, you get a lot of um, you get a lot of control, and you could probably break the system in some way or another. Um, but I needed to find a way into that U-boot image, and I wasn't able to get there at this stage. Uh, I'll actually come back to this and, and say the workaround there. And so the very earliest levels is the first stage bootloader. This is typically some very small flash embedded in this system on a chip itself. And this flash is too small to hold the U-boot loader itself. And, um, but it, it's too small to be able to just read an EXT file system and load the kernel into Amrage. It, it's basically like a mini first stage which is responsible for finding the U-boot image and then jumping to it. Uh, because it can't read the ext file system and it's too small to have the uboot image, it has to find the uboot image somewhere else. And so in this case, it was an SPI flash chip to the side, uh, on the back side of the board. That flash chip, so this little flash image can read that SPI flash, it'll read the uboot image and environment variables from there, and then jump to the uboot image. Um, this flash chip, we could reflash it, however, this is kind of a dangerous, or excuse me, the, 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 the first stage bootloader which is running on the system on a chip, we could reflash that. But if we broke that, or if we mess that image up, you've now break the device, because that's your first stage, that's all you have to access. So it's a high risk, but possibly high reward area. That's not what I wanted to attack. Um, what I, when I realized that this was reading the U-boot image off a separate SPI flash chip, then that's what I attacked. Um, here's an image of me with my gator clips attaching to the SPI flash chip and I'm reading off that flash. And on that flash contains the U-boot image itself and the environment variables for that U-boot image. One of those environment variables was the one that specifies no boot delay. So on the left side of the screen here, you can see I've got this highlighted, this boot delay equals zero. That was in that firmware image. And so all I need to do is just change that bit, the zero to like a five or something. And then I can have a chance to enter the boot console and start mucking with the device. Um, however, with SPI flash chips, you can't just change one device. 
um, you, it only supports writing pages at a time. And before you write a page, you have to erase that page. So there's a little bit of a risk there, right? You're gonna erase the page and then reflash it. And if something goes wrong, you kind of broke it. Um, but that, uh, that worked for me. I was able to change that bit, erase the flash, and then rewrite it. And so I changed this environment variable. However, what I missed is that the environment variables for U-Boot are, there's a CRC attached to the beginning of it that says, hey, if this has been broken or if this has been altered with, don't trust these environment variables. And so when I changed that boot delay parameter, I didn't change the CRC that went with it. And so it was marked invalid. Luckily for me though, U-Boot, when it found that the environment variable was correct, it went back to its fail-safe mode and its fail-safe mode had a three second delay. So I was still able to get in. Once I got on, I was able to restore the original um, environment variables or just fix the CRC. So now I had access to the U-Boot command line. And on the U-Boot command line, there's a command called ext uh, for load, uh, and which will mount, which will read a file off an ext file system into memory. And then I can view the contents of that memory. So on the right side of the screen, you see that I've read in the contents of Etsy Shadow, right? Like now I can see the root user's password hash. If I crack that hash, then I can just SSH into the box. And that, that was really exciting. That was my hope. However, I was never able to crack this hash. If you do crack that hash, I would love to hear what it is. But as you'll see in the future, it doesn't even really matter what the hash is. So getting the uh, Etsy Shadow file was no help to me. However, I mean, you mentioned earlier on the slides that I needed the EECrypt tool. I was able to read the EECrypt tool out to, like this to this hex dump, and I just used like XXD to uh, extract that EECrypt tool to a binary and start looking at that binary. And uh, as I looked at that binary, I was looking for what it does to decrypt the firmware. I never saw on the command line a key passed into that tool, so I figured it had maybe the key hard-coded inside. Um, turns out it didn't have the key hard-coded per se, however, it generated the key in a hard-coded fashion. So on the left side of the screen here are four different uh, D word values. And what the tool does is it will generate a SHA on those values in a funky way. So there's these blocks on the left side and it's just, it starts to generate a SHA value by hashing block one, two, three, four, and then block four, three, two, one, and block two, three, four, one. You know, it just hashes them in, in multiple times in just a random order. But then the output of that hash is the key. Now, it was really kind of interesting. Why did they decide to do this, right? Like, I think there was somewhere in their mindset, we know it's a bad idea to include a key, hard code a key in a binary. But instead, so instead, they're going to generate the key based on some hard-coded values. The end result is the same. I still have your key, right? Like, it didn't help anything. It just obfuscated it slightly. And so, um, I, I don't know, I don't know if they realized that this was really a, a no-op for, for a reverse engineer. So, having that key, I was then able to decrypt firmware, decrypt firmware images and start looking at the files on disk. And so here I am on slide 19. The whole, all the slides up to this was really me leading up to getting access to that firmware. As soon as I had access to that firmware, within the first hour of just looking at the files, I found my, fir I found my first RCE uh, on this. Um, here is a upgrade function that's exposed via the HTTP interface. And it calls, it makes a system call and you can see the args parameter takes uh, URL parameters and just appends it without doing any kind of user sanitation. So we can append commands to this and run things on the target. And so um, with this, I had now have execution on the target. However, it's through this funky upgrade process and it's, it's um, slightly blind. So I didn't, I wanted a cleaner way to get execution. Um, I wanted to be able to just like SSH into the box. And um, so what I did is I, changed the root user's password. However, I still couldn't SSH into the box. So I checked the settings for uh, SSH, make sure you, root user could log in and root user could log in with a password. But um, it was surprising to me that I couldn't log in even after I changed the password. I knew what the password was. Um, and it turns out, as I did some more dig digging into the um, module, that they have their own custom PAM authentication module in line. 
So for those who are not familiar or just a refresher, right, PAM is what's responsible for doing authentication on Linux. And so you could write a custom module to handle custom authentication. This custom module that they wrote uh, intercepts all um, authentication attempts. It looks at what type of attempt it is and then takes a different kind of path based on that. But it doesn't pass the attempt on down the line. So if, if it says it fails, then it doesn't try the typical Etsy shadow user password. It'll just fail. So that means that I could change the Etsy server's Etsy shadow password and it has no effect because this module intercepts the request. And that's why it didn't matter at all if I cracked that hash or had the root user password because this is what I needed to match to, to get authentication. As I looked at this tool, what it does for an authentication was very similar to the uh, mobile operators tool. It will take your you, it will take your serial number and your username. It'll generate a string based on that. So it's like username at enphaseenergy.com hashtag serial number. It'll compute an MD5 of that, and that hex digest is the actual password. So once I had this, I then had SSH access into the, the device. And that was it. Uh, once I had SSH access, it was really quite interesting. However, you notice here, it's not just SSH um, authentication that this affects. It affects the HTTP login. It attacks, um, it affects other things. And this is really a bad issue because this means as soon as you know the serial number, you know the password for any one of these devices. Furthermore, you, root, anybody who owns one of these devices can't change their password. They're stuck with that hard-coded password that the module uses. You can't remove that module, it'll break a number of the services that the in-face controller relies on. So that, that um, one decision of theirs led to three different CVEs in addition to the other that I found before. Um, all having to deal with poor password management choices. And it made me wonder, why? Why did they do something to cripple the security of this so poorly? And I can't speak for the developers. I don't know what they were thinking, but um, I, I can make some assumptions. And, and here's what I think the issue was. Is as I looked at this, I think they knew hard-coded passwords are bad ideas. And they knew we can't have one password for all the devices. That's a bad security issue. So they devised a system where each device has a unique password, but they didn't realize the other things they broke when they came up with this system. And so it was kind of a, oh, we fixed this one problem, but made four others, right? It's, um, I think it's a, we know that thou shalt not do X, but they didn't, they were just following the letter of the laws and not really understanding why that's there. And so their workarounds actually weakened the system in a lot of different ways. Um, so, really, to, to hack the devices, all I need is the serial number. And that serial number is available on the board itself. Um, it's both available as a number right here or as a small QR code right there. Or you can also get the serial number on the back of the box itself. It's on the bottom of the box itself. It's on the inside cover of the service panel. It's also on the shipping, on the outside of the shipping box that they ship to you. And then if those aren't enough, there's an XML page that's publicly available where you can get the serial number. Um, it's on the home page of the device. And then finally, if you can't find it there, it's also put in the title bar of the home page. All of this unauthenticated. So the, the serial number is everywhere. And with that serial number, you can log into these devices. So what does that mean, right? Like, what can we do with this? Well, probably could be turned into a large botnet or something or, or, you know, a DDoS tool. That's typically what we see IoT for. But I was trying to see what else could be done with this. One thing I found interesting is there's an option for the device to make a open VPN tunnel back to Enphase. And that's so that they can then, you know, SSH into your box. What's shady about that is that that means uh, Enphase has a SSH uh, open VPN tunnel into your home network or business network, whatever the case may be, which some people may be a little um, uncomfortable with. I, what I didn't check, however, if that tunnel means that you have a open VPN tunnel back into Enphase's network. I don't know if that's isolated or not. It would be something worth looking into, but I didn't want to get into any legal trouble, so I didn't poke at that myself. And moreover, I found something slightly more interesting that, that piqued my attention. 
um, as I was reading about this, I learned about the solar energy credits. Basically, as you're producing solar energy, you in some states you can earn these solar credits. Uh, a lot of companies need to meet certain regulation about how much clean energy they're using, and so these solar credits are something that's tradable on the private market. So if you're able to alter the device, you can potentially um, claim to be making more solar credits than you're actually generating, and then trade those on the black market for money, right? You're basically laundering your own money or printing your own money if you have access to one of these devices. So I played with that a little bit, and um, here is where I decided to muck with how much energy I'm producing. You can see I wasn't producing very much uh, energy until the 25th when I suddenly started producing 900 kilowatts of electricity. And so I was like, oh, this is awesome. And this is their online system here. This is their cloud monitoring base. So my, my device has reported this information up to their cloud. Their cloud accepted it and says, yep, this is what he's been generating for the last few days, every hour of the day, even at night. And the system didn't seem to complain at all. But I thought, okay, okay, well, if I can go that far, why stop there? Let's produce 100, 1.21 gigawatts, you know, like a bolt of lightning constantly coming through my household. Uh, that should generate a lot of solar credits. Um, now, to be fair, I didn't ever assign, I sign up for the solar credits. I produced this energy, or, or the cloud says I produced this energy, but I didn't sign up for the solar credits. I didn't want to get any kind of legal trouble. Um, hopefully, there's some kind of process in place which would kind of vet how much credits I, it says I'm awarded and th I mean no home solar system should be able to produce 1.21 gigawatts of power um, but who knows maybe there's something there maybe not um, we reported these issues to the vendor a while ago um, they said they have a, a fix for them I have not seen that yet but um, yeah it definitely is something that uh, is concerning and I definitely want to I would look into uh, just as an apply side is it going away, away slide um, by the looks of this and what we're seeing in other products, embedded hardware security is improving. A lot of the easy wins aren't there, right? Like the Telnet's gone, the UART port being open's gone, JTAG's being locked down. A lot of the things that we've been harping on for the longest time are improving. However, the industry still has a long way to go to make fully insecure systems a lot of the time. Um, hardware attacks are, are becoming more difficult as a lot of things are being disabled. Um, however, they're still glitching. There's still attacks where you can pull the firmware off of SPI chips like I did that um, can can still r ruin your, your setup. Um, this one, I just have to say it just because I see it so much. Never, never roll your own crypto. If you think you have a problem that's unique, like just, just, just think for a second. Am I really the first person to ever have this issue? Am I really the first person to design an IoT device where I don't want the same password for all the devices? Because you're not. And so look at industry best standards and see what they're using rather than coming up with your own solution. Coming up with your own solution rarely, rarely works. And then just that last point, I want to point out that encrypting, protecting your firmware images really goes a long way to prevent attackers from looking at things not necessarily doesn't make your system secure, but it does prevent the casual observers or those researchers from doing a quick gander and pulling some easy wins. So protecting your firmware does go a lot to keep things secret. Um, with that, I appreciate uh, you guys taking your time to listen. If you have questions or ideas, you can reach out to me. That's my email address. Uh, there's my Twitter handle, Professor Plum. There's two underscores there because uh, I was really late to the Twitter scene. But uh, I'd love to hear your comments or questions or, or thoughts or things you want or suggest I want to look at in the future and I have some free time. I love kind of doing this kind of stuff on my side as well. So I hope you guys have a great DEF CON and I will see you around. Thanks.